Moderator, can uh, we start now for the session? Thank you for all. Welcome to all uh, participation for the uh, third days of the Pakistan Evcom 2021. Thank you so much. YouTube is okay. Shall we start or shall we wait for for a one or two four minutes? Yes, we can uh, start if you want. YouTube channel is online and Zoom Master is online. Anytime Perfect. you can. Yeah, okay. It's uh, two uh, and two seconds, so let's start. Okay. So, guest speakers, our distinguished guests, and uh, our valued participants, good morning or good evening, depending on where you are. Welcome to the third and uh, second last session of the International Conference on Silk Route Heritage Collections and uh, Connections with Museums. Thank you for joining us today, both who have taken time for the registration and uh, join us on Zoom. And to those who are listening to us on the live stream at Icon Pakistan YouTube, uh, let me introduce myself. I'm Zahada Kadri, and I'm an executive board member of Icon Pakistan. I will serve you as a moderator for this forum today. Uh, before we formally uh, begin this session, first, I would like to give a brief why we have chosen the theme and our agenda behind connecting different countries to this forum. Uh, the Silk Road uh, was a mean to exchange goods and culture. It also served in the development of science, technology, literature, the art, and other fields of studies. The birth of the Silk Road acted as a bridge that allowed people to share ideas and heritage. Uh, it is it has feeding the people culturally and literally the Silk Road was not just only a single path, but a pathway that has connected people ideally. Uh, they have shared their ideas, their religion, culture and the way of life that would profoundly influence each other. It was like a shifting network of trails and shipping routes that has contributed greatly to the world's history. And that's the reason uh, we, the people of different regions, different countries and cultures um, are together because of our connection with Silk Roads. For the last three days and for one more day tomorrow, inshallah. So it has connected all of us as we feel like a family. Uh, this is an important link between us that is affecting many of our businesses. And uh, I hope these uh, series would help us achieve clarity on how we will benefit greatly by planning our part in this ambitious agenda. Uh, today, we are uh, honored to have distinguished personalities from the ICOM, UNESCO, Aga Khan Foundation, international executive boards and professors, professors from academia and ministers, ministries of museums. Before we move further, I would like to be guiding our panelists and participants. We have a short period of time to discuss this important topic, only just two hours. So, and we have 15 minutes uh, for each speaker and we have reserved 30 minutes for Q&A session in the end. I encourage you to write to uh, all the uh, participants to uh, write their question answers or concerns in the chat box. We will sort them all and we'll address as many as we can. It is a request to general participant, uh, except uh, panelists, to turn off your videos and audios, and please do not interrupt in the middle of the session or any presentation. We will be grateful for your kind cooperation. And yes, I'm so sorry if I'm not able to pronounce any name or surname correctly, although I have practiced, but I'm sorry in advance. So without any further delay, I would like to invite our respected keynote speaker, Madam Nao Hayasi, Program Specialist at the UNESCO World Heritage Center, Earlier, she was UNESCO Museum Program Coordinator for 15 years. She has also served as Program Specialist for, for Culture and was dealing with heritage, museum, culture, and sustainable development for the period of 2002 to 2014. There's a lot much to share about her. Many thanks to accept our invitation and taking time for us from your busy schedules. So, Madam Nahayasi, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Quadri. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, dear participants. Well, my name is now Hayashi, a program specialist at World Heritage Center of UNESCO, uh, which is the secretariat of the World Heritage Convention. I'd like to first express my deep gratitude to the organizer, ICOM Pakistan, in particular, Professor Mohammad Javed and Ms. Zahida Quadri coordinator and the moderator of today's session and the whole organizational team who contributed to this important event. 
So now I'm sharing my screen. I hope it works. Do you see my screen? Yes, yes, we can. Okay, very Thank good. Thank you. So, <laughs> okay. So the main topics of my talk today is uh, heritage and museums as power of reconnecting people, places and uh, histories, and in particular through the examples of initiatives along the Silk Road. So at the beginning of this uh, short talk, I want to um, I want to uh, share with you the words of Fernand Blodel, one of the most prominent figures of the French history and society and globally. He once said, uh, each part of the world recapitulates, shares in and experiences the history of the world as a whole. I find this phrase very relevant to start with our session. As a Japanese during my childhood, I was very amazed by the fact that the treasure house of the Japan's imperial family in Todaiji Temple in Nara, constructed in the 8th century, contains artifacts such as fine cut grass ball produced in Sassanid Persia. Materials used for the artifacts come from uh, actually uh, from a very wide area, including Southeast Asia, Iran, and Asia Minor. Technology and craftsmanship found in the collection include weaving styles originating in the West Asia and cut grass, the method for which was popular in the Eastern Roman Empire. Designs include those of Persia, as you see on the screen, uh, Byzantine and Greece. As this example shows, a number of heritage sites and museums in the world are places where we can experience and rediscover this infinite richness of our connected histories. So looking at uh, the side of the World Heritage, uh, so the World Heritage Convention, which now has become one of the most universal international legal tools with its 193 state parties, was born in 1972 by the growing global consciousness that a certain number of most outstanding cultural and natural treasures belong to the humanity as a whole, not only to proud nations. The many places, archaeological sites and cities on so-called Silk Roads are falling well in this category because they transcend actually national borders by witnessing the mutual influence progress and evolution in many fields of human and natural worlds. On this map, we see some of such prominent examples already inscribed uh, properties like uh, Sarasm in Tajikistan, Bamiyan in Afghanistan, and Samarkand in Uzbekistan. What we name the transboundary and or serial nominations uh, on the World Heritage List are a means to trigger international cooperation and to strengthen the conservation of exceptional historical sites and natural features. So this one example, the root network of Shannon, Shannon Corridor is a World Heritage property jointly inscribed by China, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. This inscribed area covers 5,000 kilometer section of the Silk Road network, stretching from Chinese capital of, uh, in the Han and Tang dynasties to Central Asia. These routes took shape between the second century BC and the first century AD and remained in use until the 16th century, facilitating trade, exchanges of religious beliefs, scientific knowledge, technological innovation, cultural practices, and the arts. So on this route, uh, there are 33 components uh, uh, in are included, uh, such as cities and palace complexes of various empires and the Han kingdoms, so trade settlement, uh, temples, uh, passes, etc., etc. So as we uh, talk about the Silk Route, 
website and the cities. I just uh, briefly recall that the ICOM thematic study published in 2014 provides with very interesting analysis of potential elements for future Silk Road's nominations, identifying numerous standalone sites, corridors, mountain passes, river systems, desert route. For Pakistan, it suggests uh, actually the strategic route uh, down the Indus Valley, Multan to Bangalore, linking with many uh, early maritime connections. So we know that uh, there are the connections which are uh, witnessed by these uh, heritage sites and the corrections, but how we communicate most efficiently historical connections to reconnect uh, people and places. Obviously, you are all interested in museums and working in archaeology, history, and museums. So museums are best places, I believe, to offer to reconnect uh, our cultures, civilizations, and the people. The unique experience can be provided by many means, such as new narratives and interpretation, as shown here by the examples of the project developed by individual museums and the museum associations, uh, and sometimes with UNESCO. So this project that I led uh, in the past, the Museums for Intercultural Dialogue project, for instance, cross-references museum artifact from the National Museum uh, of Damascus uh, in Syria and the Nubia Museum in Egypt. And captions are created especially on representative artifacts which highlight the historical connection between all the heritage cities since antiquity. One of such examples is this exceptional artifact found in the city of Mari, dated up to uh, third millennium BC and currently located in Syrian National Museum in Damascus. The object is known as a gift from the king of Ur, one of the most powerful states in the civilization, to the king of Mari. This statuette represents the god Anzu of Shumel mythology. So this is uh, one of the examples that we, we did for, for this kind of project. A number of World Heritage Sites also have museums or storages. This project by UNESCO worked with nine museums from six World Heritage Sites in Cambodia, Vietnam, and Laos is another example. So, the site museum's role is also essential in enhancing heritage experience by providing stories behind the world heritage sites and the places. Because sometimes I visit also many world heritage sites for, for my work, but it's sometimes difficult to, to understand uh, the meanings uh, of the site, why they are inscribed and uh, how the site uh, it's considered as outstanding and uh, representative to uh, some of the world's uh, most uh, um, important uh, endeavors. So in this project, we developed the captions on a number of the corrections from uh, the site museums uh, to explain historical connections through trade, religious influence, and artistic cross fertilization So for instance, in the middle of this um, photograph, so you, you see the, the coin, uh, discovered in Delta, the South Delta of Vietnam. And uh, this is the Roman Emperor Antoninus, uh, the coins. So this is uh, also uh, some of the remarkable examples on trade connections uh, within the Asia, but uh, beyond. So in concluding, both World Heritage Sites and the museums have gone through unprecedented difficulties since last year due to COVID-19 pandemic. So nearly half of 167 state parties with World Heritage properties have partially or totally closed sites. So impacts on international travel, incomes of local populations and other major difficulties have been reported. The most recent UNESCO report on the global museum situation which was published in March 2021, conducted with um, 104,000 museums in 87 countries, 
shows that an average of a 70% drop in attendance and a 40 to 60% decline in revenue compared to 2019. So as everybody knows, it's very difficult situation for museums and the heritage uh, uh, field. But during this difficult period, many innovative projects and approaches have been initiated. I wish to have precious opportunities like this international conference to share specific and concrete examples from academics, site managers, museum professionals to be inspired in revisiting the ways we create connections between people, places, and heritage. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, um, Madam Nehaya, now Hayasi, for sharing some very insightful and interesting analysis on the Silk Road. Also for sharing useful publication links and details about UNESCO programs. We will discuss definitely uh, it in the QN session later. So thank you so much. Thanks again. Uh, we are now finally going to start the speaker session. And this is going to be a very interesting talk for uh, all those who are uh, belong to archaeology, numismatic uh, studies. So we have Dr. Arthur Nadim, uh, our first speaker. He's a co-author of the book, The Coins of India, and investigating further into the coins metrology and the use of coins in the general marketplace. So, sir, please um, take control. Thank you so much. Uh, Hi. Hi. Um, let me just... Uh try and settle this uh, completely. It would appear that I am trying to share the screen, but as has happened in the past, there appears to be some sort of minor problem. I don't know whether it is me, and I, I totally apologize in exactly uh, what is happening. No problem, sir. If there's any problem, then we have Dr. Ali. Uh, he will help us definitely. Just hang on a second. Okay, can everyone see that? Thank you. Yes, yes, it is visible. Thank you so much. I apologize for that delay. Before I start, I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present this discussion. I would also like to thank my co author, Mohammed Tariq Ansari, and our publisher, Mohammed uh, Manahar, Publishers of Delhi. Having a CA as your research partner certainly helps when money is being discussed. My personal recollections of the Silk Road start in the early 1970s when I made my first trek along parts of the Silk Road. And over my lifetime, I have traveled the Silk Road and many of its passes and bypasses and all the way through Afghanistan, India and through parts of Bangladesh both the uh, old land route and some of the sea routes. And of course, we now have the uh, major new Silk Road that China is endeavoring to develop. For me, it was probably the greatest thing I have ever, ever done external to having a uh, dear and loving wife and married for many years. What happened was when I was studying I traveled the Silk Road and I all of a sudden discovered that what we're taught, shall we say, in the West, that everything in Europe was far superior to that of the East, was certainly wrong. And in discovering this fact, that has led me in a long journey to discoveries of what was essentially the brilliance of the Silk Road itself. So please join me in the acceptance of coinage in Silk Road trade. 
We'll start by discussing things like the invention of coinage because many things all join up. Traditional knowledge suggests that it happened around 600 BCE, originally on islands near Greece, and it replaced barter originally for the payment of government fees, taxes and charges. The definition of a coin, a piece of manufactured metal authorised by an authority of a known weight and metal, usually, that is used as a medium of exchange. However, there is a note, a more thorough research on the subject of the date and place of introduction of coinage may produce a different answer. The picture on this slide shows one of the coins from our book and we, we in fact introduce the uh, colour overlays to coinage for illustrations to world numismatics. What is needed to produce a coin? Well, of course, there is metal to produce a coin flan, a die or mould to produce an impression on the metal, a system to produce a new coin, in a known weight with multipliers and dividers. That is to say, you can have a standard coin and you can have bigger coins and smaller coins. A system that can produce the metal, especially the precious metals, in a known and consistent fineness. Fineness is percentage of particular metal in a coin. Methods to check both the weight and fineness of the metal that are relatively simple to use. And this is a key part, the methodology to check what was in a coin and technically how much that coin was comparatively worth. What was available? Well, a number of types of metal were available to produce coins. These included gold, silver and copper predominantly, but also iron, tin, zinc, as well as various alloys of copper. Dies to strike coins could be produced as well as moulds should the coins be moulded rather than struck. Not every coin was a struck coin. There were a number of major coin issuers that produced coins by pouring metal into a preformed mould. Although somewhat rudimentary, coins could be produced to an appropriate weight, even if comparative weighing by comparative weighing against the known standard. Modern coins are very, very accurate in weight. When we're talking about hand struck or molded coins, there was a known variance in weight. And this was also very important in judging whether a coin was real or not. A, sy a system existed for the production of metals and alloys that contained a known fineness of metals, especially for the precious metals. Simple systems existed for checking of the weight of a coin and the fineness of the precious metal. Coinage is a system of weights and measures. In fact, it has its own metrology. Coins are manufactured to a known weight, size and fineness of metal. For each coin issuing authority, there is, is a design that can be replicated within the level of technology, but that can be changed at will. The weight of a coin can be changed at will. The fineness of the precious metal can be altered to any desired level. The fineness of the metal can be changed at any time to any specification. No precious metal could be supplied to the mint at any fineness and the required fineness for the metrology of the series produced. This is very important to understand that by the time coins were introduced, coins of any design and any metal fineness could also be produced. For example, you could get silver in a mint that may be 60% fine and coins that could be produced out of the mint might be 95% fine. This was part of a known industrial process. Interim summary. 
Coins were produced by various authorities along the Silk Road and its very various adjacent trade territories. The metrology of the various series utilised on the length and breadth of the Silk Road varied. That is, the same size and fineness of coins varied from one end of the Silk Road, and if we give the end in the west, nominally as Rome, and the start in the east, as in China, people did not produce the same weight and fineness of coins. The official mints on the Silk Road had the technology to produce coins for their official metrology from any feed material of a similar metal. There was technology, there was technically no impediment for any coin to be accepted at any place on the Silk Road. Now this is an extremely important point. You could take a coin from Rome or a coin from Persia or a coin from anywhere, take it along the Silk Road and have it accepted anywhere else along the Silk Road. It essentially did not matter what was inscribed on the coins because it was the weight, metal content and fineness that governed its value at any point. Reality of coins on the Silk Road. Here, some of the things I'm going to say may be to many people a little strange and perhaps contestable, but as a research group, we're prepared to contest what we say because I'm educated in the West and everything in the West was superior to everything in the East or so we were told and so it's still taught in many places. However, this is far from the truth. As a researcher in numismatics, there has been the need to dispel a number of misconceptions that were taught to me as a researcher. From this point, a baseline is necessary. One, the Silk Road was in fact a highly organized system of trade and commerce. Two, along the road, coinage from any user could be accepted. Three, the expertise of bankers, money changers and vendors was such that any coin could be accepted as payment at a fair rate. And this is important, be accepted at a fair rate. Any coin offered could be easily tested for weight and metal fineness and a test cut or punch could show that the metal was not just a coating. Four, local official mints could process the metal presented and ultimately produce coins that are known and defined metrology. The refining system from antiquity, cupellation, had been mastered for centuries. And five, and this is also very important, mints were often large and technically skilled manufacturing enterprises that belie the etchings often shown for European mints. We often see a, an etching or a painting or a drawing of a mint in Europe and you have a couple of people around an open fire with a huge hammer. To produce the number of coins in some of the areas along the Silk Road and the adjacent areas, mints were perhaps the largest industrial complex within the whole territory. We have examples for ex uh, in India, through the early and middle and Sultanate and uh, the Mughal times, where internally mints employed over 80 people to produce the coins. Their limitations were, of course, the technology on how much they could carry from one point to another. But they were technically huge enterprises. The testing of hand-struck coins. And this is the absolute pinnacle of the discussion. You're sitting there in the middle of somewhere along anywhere on the Silk Road and someone presents you with a coin. Well, obviously most people couldn't read what was on it. This is a coin from one of our, one of our books, the uh, illustration and we give there what it actually says in Persian. 
but a comparative weight test could be done with a simple handheld balance and known weights. A test for fineness of the metal could be easily done by streak test or a touchstone test. The edge of the coin could be drawn across a piece of very dark or black stone and a comparison made to a standard colour swatch. Accuracies of greater than one quarter of percent of precious metal content were readily available in skilled hands. Now I could, could get when I was doing this within half a percent and I was grossly unskilled. There is some discussion that people could get within one eighth of a percent of contained precious metal. And that's quite extraordinary. To check again whether it is metal all the way through, a test punch or mark could be applied to test the depth of the precious metal. The illustration shows a test mark on the obverse and the reverse. Such punch test marks did not affect the weight of the object. And again, this illustration is prepared by Tarek and I for our fourth book, which is the coins of Orangzeb, which is uh, probably is so large it's within two parts. The reality of coins on the Silk Road. Again, although I'm repeating myself, I think it is quite necessary because of some, some ideas that the Silk Road was compartmentalized and that there, there, there was a problem that you had to keep changing coins along the Silk Road and you were going to be ripped off or if you didn't do things in the Western way, you would be disadvantaged. Uh, this is uh, far from the truth. And there's a little bit on the bottom that's in green on this slide that is hard to see. It's hard to see for a reason and I'll read it out. And there will be some horrors from some people who listen to this. Any coin was acceptable and trade along the Silk Road. Even with the technical expertise of money changes, etc., many coins would have been unreadable. The testing of coins and nominal comparative value was a simple process. Varying comparative values between different metals could be a source of profit in trade. The organisational structure of commerce along the road allowed for free and open trade. Gresham's law, bad money drives out good. This is part of the standard discussion in numismatics. Someone produces a coin with less fineness of metal, therefore the good coins are hoarded, etc. Well, it essentially didn't apply to the Silk Road. All coins could be accepted and valued by a known and accepted system. The bit that you really can't read there says the significance of hoard finds. Now, I've been involved throughout the years in a number of hoard finds along the Silk Road and parts of the Silk Road. One, the coins of all types were accepted on the Silk Road. Two, coins from any issuer could be easily recoined to a coin of any realm. And there is no real significance in such finds other than that they were part of normal trade. This will be a shock to a number of researchers, and I've discussed this over the years, where great store is placed in, oh, look, we found a... Uh, a lovely set of Roman coins uh, in the middle of Afghanistan or somewhere up in the Pamirs or in the deserts in China. Really, this was just part of what happened. And it really isn't anything greatly remarkable other than no one has dug them up in the past or why they were buried. And this is the essence of what happened on the Silk Road from the start until the technical end of it. It was such a wonderful marketplace where anything and everything was accepted and accepted with good business sense. New uh, pathway. I'm sorry, Dr. Otter, we have just five minutes left, please. Okay, well, um, may I just uh, add uh, two short points? We'll take one minute, please. Yes, please. Take five minutes, no problem. I'm just okay. Five minutes. Yes, okay, please. I'll be I'll be finished in five minutes. New pathways in coin metrology studies one. The common names for coins often in numismatic literature can be confusing. 
and similar names can be used for coins of different metals and sizes. Sorry, I've just read the wrong thing in my uh, haste here. With new technologies, metrology studies can be undertaken rapidly and non-invasively. With the understanding that all coins could be rapidly valued by competent people at the time of issue, regionally specific metrologies can be standardised. Metrology of coins must now include weight, metal type, percentage of contained metal and physical dimensions. For regional series, a simple decision can be made for the metrology of the standard unit for each coin. The standard unit for each metal, including billon, is described with the identity of 100. Series may consist of multipliers and dividers of a unit. The metrology of a standard unit may change at any time in weight, physical dimension and metal fineness. Two, the common names for coins often used in numismatic literature can be confusing and similar names can be used for coins of different metals and sizes. The actual common name or any name may or may not appear on the coin itself. The unit system when utilized with the actual fineness of metal and weight produces a working figure for instant comparison of real value. Contrary to popular thought, the marketplace could adjust rapidly to any changes in metal content and weight. The corollary to the theorem is that the value of the coin reflects the metal content, and this for the time and trade of the historic Silk Road was an accurate assumption. The non-invasive metal text testing, and that is XRF. Fundamentally, the technology is long established and when used with standard operating procedure and trained operators produces results that cannot be technically challenged. One, I have a long personal experience with using this technology in high-end commercial use. I have used the technology in numismatics for a number of years, including arranging major testing at such locations as the Asmolean Museum at Oxford University. Major discoveries have been made. The negativity surrounding the use of modern XRF technology is based on errors of assumption due to either lack of technical understanding of its use and possible limitations, although its apparent limitations can be overcome by a carefully prepared standard operating procedures. Or it has not been accepted because the undoubted results may not fit a working current narrative. It is time for modern journal papers to move from the technical discussions on its use to actual, actual results, and our future work will include results. We have a standard operating procedure for modern XRF technology use. Summary. The trade on the Silk Road for its entire length was highly organized and regulated. Coins of any type of metal fineness could be reminted to produce coins of any desired weight, design and metal. Fineness. Charges for the exchange of coins from the one issuer to another or the reminting of coins from one issuer to another were part of the normal trade expenses. Similar to the uh, current buy and sell rates of modern currencies in the market today. There was an essence a known unit rate for all currencies and that depended on its weight and fineness of the contained metal. Hoard finds at various places along the Silk Road whilst the technical interests are just part of a trade network and are nothing or anything or they are basically nothing extraordinary. They are part of what happened. Future research and this is where we have embarked from, from very recently when we came out of commercial and confidence work, a number of new endeavours. Utilisation of quality controlled, non-invasive element, metallurgical and non-metallurgical testing by use of XRF to understand element composition of coins and other materials. Note, XRF is just not 
used in coins, it can be used on basically anything. The interaction with various other areas of study, such as metallurgy, mining, geology, and economics, with traditional numismatic studies to produce better researched and connected catalogues, manuscript, and databases. The utilization of better illustrations in numismatics, we have pioneered the color overlay systems. The use of the unit system of metrology to fully understand the ability for current for currencies to interconnect with a highly ordered transnational trading scheme that traversed the known world, complete the understanding of the technical abilities of mints, especially in the greater Asia area. That ends my discussion and thank you for the time. I could speak about it for about six months, but we'd all be probably bored. And as such, we have opened up quite a large number of new areas for research and publishing. Thank you. Been most appreciated. Mrs. Zayda Katri, uh, interrupt you. Uh, uh, there is some problem. Your sound. Uh, a bit low, a bit low now. No, a bit still going on. No. Oh, you can hear me? Yes, I hear, but very deep. Please check your sound. Uh, let me. Okay, thank, uh, thank you. Is it it's working? Okay. Quite good, yes, thank you. <laughs> okay, maybe it's a hike in my scarf, so that's why my voice will be, you know, hike somewhere. So I'm really sorry for the uh, time limitation of your author, uh, but uh, I must say that uh, it's a great opportunity for those who are working with you. And uh, I really appreciate your work and uh, vision. Thank you so much. Next, we have Dr. Marike from Legan University in Netherlands. Uh, she's a lecturer and researcher at the Faculty of Archaeology. Uh, she's specialized in the archaeological evidence of ancient trade routes between the Indian subcontinent, Egypt, and East Africa up to the mid uh, first millennium CE. Uh, currently, she's working on Krakram Mountain uh, Range Heritage. So, Madam Marika, please, the floor is yours. Take the control. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to try and share a recording of my PowerPoint, which is exactly 15 minutes. So hopefully that will work and uh, the internet connection uh, will allow it. Uh, let's see. Uh, one moment. I'm not sure if I can, otherwise I will share the PowerPoint. Yes, let's see. Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Um, you, you, when I, I try the PowerPoint, if you can hear it like this. Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry, which one do you prefer? Video or the uh, online Zoom, uh, online Zoom uh, PPT presentation? Uh, PowerPoint one moment, presentation. one moment. Oh, one second. Uh, it seems to be double, doesn't it? Uh, one moment. But could you hear the PowerPoint when I shared it just now? Maybe PowerPoint sharing is the better, I think. Okay. One okay, thank you. We trust you. You saved it 15 oh, minutes well, on time. <laughs> no matter. Um, thank okay, you so much. Um, I will try it one more time. Um, okay. Uh, let me get... Back to the beginning. At least I have a backup, so that should be good. Um, here we go. Okay, now I'm going to start um, the PowerPoint. Let's see. Sorry that it's taking so long. Um, If you chose your the video type, you please sharing options, 
check yeah. the sound sound options on the bottom yeah. but i can't uh yeah, I left can't share yes. the video but i can share the powerpoint uh hang on i'll try to share the video like this Uh, Mrs. Zaida Kadri, do you have any yeah. presentation? Uh, Mrs. Maria Vanarde, do you have? Uh, is it not working? Sorry. No matter. It's not working. Okay, it's working on my Zoom. Um, oh, okay, yeah. one. I'm very sorry. It seemed to work. Um, shall I try again? Yes, of course. Okay. Um, here we go. Share. Control F5 or the button uh, bottom right. Magnification yeah, next this. to this. Yes. I did uh, this. Okay. We couldn't see, uh, unfortunately. I'm so sorry. Um, okay. Stop share. I will try this all over again. Okay. Um, okay. I'm trying again. I'll just use the PowerPoint presentation uh, this time. Can you see my PowerPoint now? It's not full screen now. No, um, I'm, but you can see it. We see it, but it's not full screen. No, if I now put it on full screen, it should start. The video should start. So I'm um, going of to Of course, try. I think. Yes. Uh, if not, maybe you, you yeah, maybe if not, uh, instead of the full screen, you can follow in this manner. Yes. Um, yes, I'm going to try that right now. Okay, thank you. We saw full screen without yeah. sound. Uh, it, no sound? No sound. Uh, when you are sharing, sharing a page, uh, yeah. bottom left, you uh, can, you have to check the sound. I did. It says full. You did it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. But we I'm couldn't, so sorry. Yeah, we um, couldn't hear. I have, a, I have a backup plan. One moment. Okay. Um, this this has often happened with Zoom. I really don't understand why. I have also uh, uploaded the video on YouTube in a secure channel, so I'm going to try and share that screen with you all. Okay. Then maybe that will work. Uh, is it possible that we can uh, so, play this PPT and then you can uh, read whatever the presentation says? Uh, one moment. I think this may work. Can you see this? Of course. Yeah, then 
hopefully if I start this video now, it should work. Uh, no. There's no sound, unfortunately. No sound. <laughs> this is so strange. The sound works on my settings. Um, I really don't understand. Um, Maybe on time you can share with you video still going on and at the same time you can share with your presentation uh, for the no, saving time. Wait, wait a moment. Yeah. Um, one moment. Okay, I suggest um, how about I send the link to the video in the chat and then people can watch it. Uh, you just have to follow the link. Okay. Um, that should do it. So if you follow the link in the chat, that should um, go directly to the talk. And then everyone should be able to watch. It will just not be in Zoom. Is that an option? Uh, like, uh, like Dr. Ali Jack, is it I can Dr. help Ali? you. Uh, I can help you. I can show this okay. video. Okay. Yes. If, if you course. can somehow do it, then please. Uh, yes, please of do course. It. I can I can show. Please. Right. It's working on YouTube. Beautiful. Yes, please. Let me check again. again. You, you see the videos, I know. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I want to thank the organizers for inviting oh, yeah. me to speak at this Voices. conference. Okay, there, there is no problem, I think. Yeah, okay. yeah, please go ahead. Okay, please go ahead. And many okay. apologies Th for all no, that. No matter. Still going on. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at this wonderful conference. In the next 15 minutes, I will briefly talk about the archaeological aspects as well as the heritage initiative of the Karakoram project that I coordinate with my colleague Abdul Ghani Khan, who presented at this conference on Monday. And in our work, we focus on the many implications of ancient rock art from this region. As a quick reminder here of the uh, crucial geographical location of the Karakoram Mountains, uh, in antiquity, this region uh, functions very much as a crossroads for trade routes and interactions between the ancient Indian subcontinent, all the trade uh, caravans and traffic that would come in from the west towards the steppes in the north and ancient China in the east. And it is mainly from uh, rock art, uh, ancient rock carvings, that we still have archaeological evidence of uh, the occurrence of these trade routes. Uh, actual excavations are very rare in these parts. It's also, of course, a very uh, remote mountainous era. And the ground is very difficult, of course, to excavate in. Uh, but there are uh, many, uh, many thousands of uh, clusters of rock art already known from this region. Um, and a very large percentage, which has actually never yet been recorded. Uh, here on the slide are some of the well-known uh, examples, which were recorded by a joint German and Pakistani team in the 1980s and 90s, which focused very much on a, a specific section of Gilgit Baltistan in the Chilas and Talpan region. And uh, the variety and diversity of carvings encountered uh, it was very remarkable. Uh, as you see here, uh, large and elaborate uh, Buddhist carvings of stupas, which were uh, uh, carved along these roots, uh, but also many evidence of uh, horses, camels, uh, inscriptions that mention uh, specific rulers or uh, trade caravans passing through. And there's also a great deal of hunting scenes and more simplistic animal uh, carvings dating back even uh, even more than uh, these uh, very famous Buddhist carvings, which we could date around roughly 2000 years ago, while some of the hunting scenes and animal carvings uh, may most likely date from prehistoric times. 
Now, the majority of studies so far on rock art from the Karakoram region has focused on the uh, Buddhist carvings, uh, such as the elaborate uh, stupas, which in their architectural depiction uh, can be matched quite closely to some of the earliest uh, known uh, architectural stupas from the Gandhara region uh, in Pakistan, north of the Indian subcontinent, where we encounter such structures from as early as the time of the Maurya uh, kings from around 300 BC. And this uh, practice, these buildings continue well into also the Kushan era. Uh, up until 200 to 300 CE. And but most studies so far single out uh, these, uh, these drawings and focus on the iconography and the Buddhist implications of uh, these carvings. Um, however, with uh, my project and with my colleagues, uh, we started in 2018 uh, to use uh, the uh, the rock art not only for iconographical studies or art historical studies uh, but to use the statistics and the coordinates of the distribution of the many different types of carvings that uh, were in recording to also try and literally chart out the routes through the mountains and here on the slide, you see one of our first publications out in 2009 in open access, uh, where the uh, implications and the importance of studying the rock art in this more scientific uh, and large scale way also uh, shows valuable new information about the dynamics of the ancient historical silk roads. And you see we used graphs and basic uh, statistics to approach these distributions. And in 2020, uh, also together with my colleague uh, Mr. Khan, we uh, published another uh, a follow up at uh, Oxford, the Kandara project, Kandara Connections project, also available in open access in this volume, uh, where we used multiple data sets focusing not only on the Buddhist carvings, but also on animal carvings and statistics of distribution to really approach a actual tangible map of these routes. And while doing so, we started to discover all kinds of very interesting patterns among the distribution of the rock art that really seemed to indicate different uh, station posts, different phases in these ancient Silk Road trade routes. Here on the slide, you see several of our first distribution charts and where we look in this case at different animal species and how they are distributed at specific sites. And when we combine this information, we can see different patterns. For example, in this case, we found that uh, at sites where we find a lot of depictions of Buddhist stupas, caravan depictions, uh, we find almost exclusively domestic animals depicted, like horses and camels. Whereas in uh, the spaces in between the clusters of Buddhist and anthropomorphic art, we mainly see wild animals depicted, like all kinds of wild mountain goats and makors, uh, snow leopards, etc. And these, this spacing seemed quite evenly uh, traceable. And so it seems that these routes, the actual trade routes, had specific points along the route uh, where caravans, for example, could uh, pass the night or have specific trade posts. And these were often linked with also larger activity at the uh, Buddhist carvings. And so possibly these were uh, devised for Buddhist worshippers who traveled uh, towards the east through the mountains, keeping in mind that from the Maurya era onwards, uh, Buddhism became a very dominant religion in the north of the Indian subcontinent. And so this uh, correlation seems to make sense with the ancient historical Silk Roads in might. And it is particularly interesting how zooming out, as it were, from the individual carvings and their iconography, but also studying the statistics of their distribution really helps us to reconstruct these ancient roots. Here uh, on the map, a very preliminary hypothetical distribution uh, charts and the, the green yellow lines is what based on what we uh, studied so far, the most likely actual route through the mountains up towards uh, the steppes and the Tarim Basin uh, to the 
east. Um, but of course here uh, the issue to continue this type of work is the lack of recorded data. So far the uh, German Pakistani team uh, from up until the 90s have only documented a very uh, small percentage compared to what is there left in the mountains. And for this region, uh, Mr. Khan and I undertook last year a new project to continue to document uh, previously unstudied or at least unpublished carvings in this region. Uh, with the support of the Prince Klaus Fund for Culture and Development and the Aleph Alliance, uh, we managed to get a uh, fieldwork project off the ground in spring this year at the sites of Allenbridge and Chilas II. Uh, noted here uh, on the map, uh, the carvings of these sites were never yet published and made available for wider uh, academic study. And one of the main reasons also for our project is uh, the uh, current threat and urgency involved in documenting these rock art. Um, as shown here on the slide, you can see some of the uh, damaged graffiti that has been uh, conflicted uh, onto uh, many examples of the rock art. Uh, throughout time, damages, destruction, some rocks are cut for uh, building materials, and there is also an upcoming uh, dam, the Diyamar Basha Dam, which will in the near future flood many uh, areas of the valleys where rock art is located, making it impossible uh, for studying and recording them further. And for this reason, uh, Mr. Khan and I worked together uh, to set up a heritage documentation project where we photographed and recorded the coordinates of as many carvings as possible in these areas. And our aim is uh, very much to publish them in open access and make all our data available to uh, the global community. Now, to sum up very briefly and the, to focus on the archaeological significance of these uh, data and our project in particular, of course, the main uh, essence of it is that we are dealing with never yet published archaeological evidence, of human travel and presence across the Karakoram, which is, of course, again, very vital for understanding and reconstructing the uh, early Silk Road routes through the Karakoram in particular. And a very new element here uh, that my project is uh, is using for this research is to focus on distribution patterns and satellite studies to enable the reconstruction of these ancient routes and to identify potential settlements and station posts. And we are working with digital archaeologists uh, for trans-regional database analysis and pattern recognition. And we can also incorporate the previous data from previous campaigns in these types of research. Research. But of course, apart from that, uh, the individual carvings and the many inscriptions in Brahmi and Karoshti, uh, they also give us more and more insight into ancient Buddhist art, many diverse human activities in the region, as well uh, as the impacts on biodiversity. So as a whole, this uh, rock art uh, uh, data set, as it were, is immensely valuable and there is uh, still a great deal to learn about the many uh, very important aspects of this historical region. During our fieldwork in spring, led by Mr. Khan, uh, we recorded a total of 228 boulders uh, on which uh, several hundreds of individual carvings uh, we managed to document. Uh, we are still currently in the process of uh, cataloging them, making all the line drawings, analyzing and interpreting all the data. Here on the slide, you see some examples uh, of the Buddhist uh, carvings, as well as inscriptions and some of the animal carvings uh, that we encountered. Um, of course, the data processing is also a very long process, uh, but we are working hard to make them available as soon as possible. A very important uh, component of our project was also our community outreach. And one of the uh, main reasons for a lot of the damage and graffiti done over the years to these ancient rock art is a lack of education. Uh, Mr. Khan and his team uh, reached out to uh, the communities around Chilas and Allenbridge 
uh, gave educational workshops and engaged with the communities uh, who in many cases were not aware that these rock art were so old and were evidence of uh, 2000 years ago or even longer. Um, so these education initiatives are very important, uh, not only for the preservation of the important uh, rock carvings, but also to engage the local communities more directly with their beautiful heritage of their home region. Uh, for that reason, apart from just education, a passive outreach, uh, we very actively engaged with them, invited uh, the uh, community members to help with the actual archaeological documentation, uh, to help with the recordings of many of these rock art. And we, uh, what this was met with much positivity. Uh, many of them were very interested to learn more. Uh, about the history of their region and uh, also to learn more about the specific carvings from which different times uh, they were. Um, this, of course, uh, we also uh, very much incited and, and encouraged uh, people to the idea of uh, how to uh, continue once the archaeological recordings and publications are done. Of course, the rock art still remains uh, in the region. And the idea to engage in a certain open air museum where the rock art are protected, guarded by the local communities, where they can also host tourists uh, and manage these sites together also with the local authorities and the uh, local authority of Gilgit Baltistan were also very positive uh, towards this initiative and with our project uh, we very much hope to continue to support this initiative and it's very important that uh, as scientists we don't simply come to a region record the data and write papers um, but that we also think about what happens with the heritage that remains and also uh, how can people from the region whose heritage it is how can they also benefit from it and for this reason uh, we find it very important as well that we will make also our scientific findings uh, widely and openly available through open access so that anyone uh, basically with an internet connection can have access to it. On behalf of our entire team, uh, thank you for your attention and please contact me in case of further questions. Thank you for the technical help uh, to the organizers. I'm glad that it still worked. Thank you so much. It's really an interesting presentation, and I really like uh, your idea. Of... Uh, sorry, uh, I can't hear you. I uh, Ma uh, yes, sure. of course. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I really like your idea of open air museum because rock art uh, unfortunately cannot be transferred and cannot be you know put in the museum. So we can do some kind of efforts in uh, with 3D images or something. But open air museum is really a great idea. Thank you so much for sharing your research. Um, next, we have a long journey <laughs> from uh, London to Beijing, and uh, I must say that we fasten your seat belts because we have uh, Mr. Christopher Walton uh, on the board who will take us on a journey across 16 countries. And we will discuss his um, 40,000 kilometer, uh, mostly over, uh, overland journey across uh, Eurasia in 2019 over a period of four months. Uh, and um, interestingly, he has traveled by car, bus, train, horse. I mean, he has used all the transportations. And uh, let's listen more from him uh, about his journey and about the work uh, which Aga Khan Foundation has done. Uh, please, Mr. Wajan, uh, the next speaker. Hello, thank you so much uh, for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak to you all today. Um, it's a great uh, privilege. And uh, um, so, um, uh, as Zadi has said, um, uh, uh, in 2019, I traveled overland from London to Beijing, covering 16 countries and about 40,000 kilometers. And I want to take you on that journey in the next 15 minutes, if I can just about manage it. Um, and um, but before I do that, I, I should introduce myself briefly again. I'm the head of communications at the Aga Khan Foundation in the UK. I'm also a, a photographer and uh, do photography for you know different media outlets and of course the foundation also. So um, before I get into taking on that journey, I just want to provide a little bit of context. So um, let me put uh, my share my screen so you can see that. Please tell me if you can't see it for some reason. 
but I'm going to assume you can. This is the name of the project. Uh, the main thrust of it is, is, a, is an outdoor photography exhibition in London. And I'll show you some pictures of that towards the end of this presentation. I'm just gonna set my timer so I'm, I'm keeping a good, good pace with this. Here we go, Start. right. Okay, so um, a little bit of context, you all know what the, the Silk Road is, so I'm not going to go into that, but I will say that um, it is a region, um, I suppose broad region, but in the Central and South Asian region and the Middle East where the Aga Khan Foundation, a charitable organization and the broad Aga Khan Development Network, uh, which, which work together to improve the quality of, of life for marginalized communities, mostly in these regions have been active in South Asia for over 100 years and in Central Asia for th over 30 years. And over that time, we've invested or channeled several billion dollars into a variety of different development projects from health and education, food security, disaster risk reduction, climate change mitigation, telecoms, broadband, energy, uh, you name it, we're, 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 we're involved in some way. Um, and so it's a region that's very, very important to us. And so we were interested in, in exploring uh, how to raise awareness about that region and about our, our work in it. I should say that our kind of values around pluralism, self-reliant and women's empowerment are sort of uh, cross-cutting theme across all of our work. So a little bit about what we wanted to achieve through this project was about revealing the wonders of the Silk Road to broader audiences, particularly the kind of cultural heritage and the, and the, and the diversity of, of, of cultural expressions along it, both historical and contemporary, um, to reveal some of those connections between what appear at first glance to be quite different and separate uh, and distant cultures, build bridges of interest and understanding between uh, distant cultures, and challenge perceptions of, well, of less well-known and understood parts of the world. And this is, I should say, just a, a UK-focused project at the moment, but uh, you'll, I'll tell you a little bit later about where we're going with it next. So uh, this is the journey I took in 2019. Lucky me that I didn't plan this for 2020, um, but it was, um, as you can see here, a zigzagging line from London to Beijing. My first job was in Beijing in 2007. And I remember flying back and forth and looking out the window and thinking, God, I know nothing about what is outside that window, looking down and wondering and always kind of plotting and thinking, what would an overland journey look like? And so in 2019, I left from King's Cross and Pancras Station, which is in the center of London. And I went on the Eurostar to Paris and just started heading eastward. So my, uh, my first kind of major port of call was, um, was uh, uh, Venice, which you can see here, this, this sort of maritime city, this uh, built on a lagoon established in the seventh century. But by the 15th century, it had all these trade links, as you know, with the Safavids in Iran and the Ottomans of Turkey and the, and the Mamluks of, Cairo, of, of Egypt and Syria. And as a result, not only goods came to the city, but also ideas. Um, and so you can see here, some art historians point to these these, these, um, these uh, uh, lanterns at the top of St. Mark's Cathedral, and they say they echo those found at the top of, of minarets in Cairo, which you can see on the right here. Similarly, that tile work you see on the Doge's Palace on the right of the left-hand picture, people say was a pastiche of the kind of work that was being done by the Ilkhanid dynasty thousands of kilometers away in, uh, in Central Asia. But these ideas traveled and they were replicated. And so you see all these sorts of examples of the East in the West in, uh, in Venice. And this is something that I wanted to explore photographically throughout the whole journey, these, these references between different cultures. Then crossing the Adriatic down um, into Dubrovnik here, another city which has been invaded by pretty much every single neighbor it's ever had. And so it is a real mishmash of different cultures. But interestingly, in the context of COVID, I think in 1322, this was the first city in the world to institute a uh, quarantine on new travelers coming in because of obviously they were bringing not only goods, but plague and other diseases with them. So on those, um, uh, those islands you see behind, not those ones, but maybe in the distance, they'd have to sit there for 40 days, which is where we get the word quarantine, quarantino, 40 days. Then moving south to Mostar, this is in Bosnia and Herzegovina. This is the, um, the Starry Moss Bridge over the Navretta River. And uh, I read a travelogue by Evlia Chalebi, the Ottoman writer and uh, traveler from the 16th century. And he spoke about young men who would take uh, coins and, and uh, from visiting uh, viziers and notables and then cry Ya Allah and jump off the bridge into the water. And if you've been there, you will notice that people still do that today, 400 years later. Um, 
It was also a bridge that was destroyed, as you know, in the early 90s and was restored by um, a variety of different organizations, including the Aga Khan Trust for Culture, not the bridge, but the old town around it. It was also as I moved eastward the first time that I heard the call to prayer. This is in a, a small um, Ottoman era mosque for leather tanners. Then zigzagging through um, the Balkans on this amazing train um, from Montenegro to Serbia, uh, to Belgrade, goes through about 400 tunnels and about across 200 bridges built by the Soviets. And then into uh, uh, Belgrade here, we're in a Serbian Orthodox church. And as you know, in that area of the Balkans, all of these different religious uh, orders and different religions meet. And in Sofia, you have this wonderful square called the Square of Religious Tolerance, where you have a mosque, a synagogue and two churches as well. So it's this area of, of, of confluence. And then just to give you a sense of where we are on the map, although I'm sure you will appreciate it, we're now moving into Istanbul. Of course, this is the Blue Mosque uh, built in the, I think the 17th century, an imperial mosque. Uh, but it took a lot of its architectural cues from the Hagia Sophia, which you see in the foreground here, which was of course originally a church built a thousand years before that, um, and then became a mosque uh, when it's, uh, Constantinople was taken by the Ottomans. Um, and then became a, uh, a, a museum in the early 20th century under the reforms by Ataturk and is now, as you know, become a mosque again. Um, but it's interesting that that design, that shallow dome, you see it, it's so iconic. It's across the entire Ottoman Empire. You see these, or the old Ottoman Empire, these types of, of mosques. Um, this is the, of course, the, the Grand Bazaar, a kind of Silk Road engine uh, built by the Ottomans. Uh, and, uh, and today about 90 million people pass through it each year. It's a pretty extraordinary place. Um, I was also documenting different kind of religious uh, sects or orders. Here we have, of course, the, uh, the whirling dervishes, which was an active form of meditation established by um, Rumi, uh, the, the Sufi mystic and poet in the 13th century. And in a sense was to, 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 to create a sense of, of, of ecstasy in your mind as you spin, to make you feel closer to God, to desert your ego. And uh, as you return from this journey, you're better able to love and be of service to all creation. And so here's some more photos of that. This is a particular performance that took place in Bayolu in, in, in Istanbul. And here we're into Konya, which is the resting place of Rumi here. You can see in that turquoise conical dome on the left, this is the picture on the right is underneath it, his, his final resting place. Of course, I passed many caravanserais, which as you know, were the sort of original travel lodges of the, uh, of, of the, or during the Silk Road heyday, built 30 kilometers distance apart. That's a day's journey. Of course, the horses, camels, traders would come and rest here, uh, um, um, uh, share information with each other, uh, wash, pray, eat, and, uh, and quarantine before they came into the cities. And then moving east, you, this is um, um, Mount Ararat, um, of course, where Noah's Ark reputedly hit ground, and you have this amazing Christian kind of heritage from the from the old Armenian kingdoms in the 10th century in this eastern part of Turkey, here on Lake Van, um, another photograph here, and then this is the city of Ani, which sat at the crossroads of the Silk Road, became very rich, was known as the city of a thousand and one churches, but was sacked by the Mongols and, uh, and others over time, so that now only a few vestiges of that great city remain. So we're crossing the border into Iran now. This is the, uh, the, 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 the um, Bazaar of Tabriz, the largest covered marketplace in the world. It's got, I don't know, uh, I think it has 6,000 covered streets, How employs maybe 40,000 people. It's absolutely enormous. Here we are in the, uh, of course, the carpet section, um, still a roaring trade going on there. And uh, very, very, you know, there were 22 caravanserais in here. I think Marco Polo repeatedly stayed in it in the 13th century. You don't see too many computers or smartphones. This guy's even using an abacus here. Um, it's pretty old school. And now we're into Sultaniyeh. This is, of course, the mausoleum of Oljaitu built in 1312, I think. Correct me if I'm wrong. And he was a, he was a Mongol general who came, conquered grounds in northern uh, land in northern Persia, and then uh, brought with him these ideas, these architectural ideas, which he mixed with local Persian styles. But also he then took on the religion of those that he conquered. He became a Muslim and this was his mausoleum. Here are some of the pictures from the early 20th century of it. So you can see the restoration work that's been going on for about 50 years. Now we're into Isfahan, of course, the capital of the Safavid Empire established, well, became the capital in, I think, 15, 
98, Shah Abbas I wanted to make it the most beautiful city in the world. And uh, in order to do so, he brought many Chinese artisans to uh, uh, Isfahan and uh, to train local artisans, but also to mix the styles to be able to create these beautiful um, uh, tile work, which covers uh, uh, many of the, of, of the mosques and uh, palaces there. You can see some of that gorgeous uh, 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 Mukarnas uh, um, styling there. This is from the Sheikh Lot Fala Mosque, another imperial mosque. The ceiling details here are pretty spectacular. And of course, that legacy of, of artisanal craft is still very much alive today. Here's the, uh, um, uh, the bazaar, many artisans still at work. I'm just looking at time, so I'm going to race through, miss a few. We're into Yazd here, um, which is also the unofficial capital of Zoroastrianism in, 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 Pers in, in Iran. Um, and here's a Tower of Silence where Zoroastrians would bring their dead. They would uh, uh, be left here to, so that the, the vultures could pick the flesh off the bones because the skin was uh, is, is, is perceived to be impure and a pollutant, so it couldn't be a body could not be buried. Into the Loot Desert, the hottest place on earth. Here it was about 55 degrees where I was, and um, it got to 70 degrees 70 degrees down the road, about 200 kilometers. But I missed that. Cross the border to Turkmenistan, we start to see that Soviet influence but also mixing with, uh, with Islamic geometry there. You can see this is the largest indoor Ferris wheel in the world, in case you ever wanted to go. Some more of the architecture from there. And uh, this is Konya Urgench, which was sacked by um, the Mongols and then Tamerlane, but still some of these beautiful designs that you can still see, which went on to influence the Mughals amongst others into Kiva, a real uh, Silk Road uh, desert city of the imagination. Some of the, uh, the Taush Hauli Palace here, the beautiful ceilings that you find there. Again, that middle Central Asian aesthetic mixing with Islamic geometry here, that red and floral motifs, some more of the ceilings and into uh, Samarkand. Um, I'll just race through some of these here again. You can see that lovely tile work, that, that Kufic calligraphy um, that, that, that covers the buildings there. Um, some of the artisanal crafts that can be found in the Fagana Valley, which still has this great kind of artisanal heritage. Cross the border into Kyrgyzstan and you're away from all that kind of cultural, architectural um, craft heritage, but into these amazing landscapes um, that go on forever. It's like a land before time. Aga Khan Foundation works extensively there across healthcare, early childhood development, agriculture and food security, especially in the context of climate change. Just tell you an interesting story about this guy. I had uh, this photograph and then it was published in uh, National Geographic Traveler in the UK. And then I sent it to my colleagues in, in Kyrgyzstan and they printed it, framed it and gave it to the man. And you can see him here receiving it. And he was pretty, pretty pleased about that. Um, this is the Aga Khan, this is the University of Central Asia, uh, a university established by His Highness the Aga Khan with the, the, the governments of Tajikistan, Kyrgyzstan and, and Kazakhstan. This is in Narin. Um, it's an amazing place. It really, I would uh, uh, encourage you to visit it if you're in the area. It's bringing world-class education to tertiary cities in Central Asia and hopefully developing the futures, the, the, the region's future leaders. Another caravanserai in Kyrgyzstan and we're in these alpine um, um, lake area called Songkul, still very much a, a horse culture there. Um, and now we're crossing to Tajikistan. These are semi-nomadic people. Uh, you can tell they're Kyrgyz because they're wearing those iconic Kalpak hats. So they're crossing the border. They're bringing their yak, their horses, their camel here to graze in the summer pastures. You can see some yurts in the foreground. Um, and then it gets too cold. One of the one, many valleys we work in in this region to bring particularly energy, which uh, after the fall of the Soviet Union, a lot of the, of the region um, uh, uh, lost access to electricity. So we've been slowly working to, to reestablish those ele uh, uh, electricity links, uh, work a lot in tourism promotion in the region and uh, the restoration of historic buildings. This is a, 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 an old, uh, it's called Zamiri Parasht, an old fortress. There was supposed to be a, a Zoroastrian temple here as well. In the distance, you can see uh, the Pianj River and the mountains of Afghanistan. And across uh, this region, we built six bridges reconnecting Afghanistan and Tajikistan, you, which were, which were uh, separated by um, the uh, 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 Russian and British empires in the late uh, 20th, uh, 19th century. And uh, this is one of six bridges Afghanistan is on the left of the river, Tajikistan is on the right, and people can trade visa-free across that bridge. Now, in order to get to uh, northern Pakistan, I was unable to cross the Wakhan Corridor because of security concerns at the time, so I had to take a 7,000 kilometer detour uh, to get back up there via Dubai. So unfortunately, I did have to take a flight, 
and then went uh, to Lahore while I was there. And this is another wonderful restoration project, the, the, the Mughal picture wall in, in Lahore, um, which is being restored by this fantastic team from the Aga Khan Trust for Culture. You can see before, above, be after, below, that's 50 meters and they've got another 400 to go. So it's a massive project. And then up to the north, you have these wonderful, um, uh, uh, this is the, the Kaplu Palace, another restored by the Trust for Culture and turned into a heritage hotel. This is actually a nearby one, also restored by the Trust for Culture and turned into a heritage hotel. So you can stay in these wonderful buildings. I really encourage you to do so if you haven't. And of course, there's a great uh, uh, Buddhist influence in this region. It was the predominant religion before the arrival of Islam in about the 15th century. Um, and you can still see some of that heritage alive today. I will skip through these. Um, some of the characters, this is the Hunza Valley um, beyond him. Um, some incredible peaks there as the Himalayas, Karakoram and Hindu Kush mountains meet. Altit Fort, uh, restored by the Trust for Culture. And uh, through that process has, has worked with local um, uh, women to train them in m carpentry, masonry. And they literally built that school in the bottom, re bottom right. It's a music school I visited in 2019. In the top left, you can see them making it. And now people are actually in there playing music, learning music, and uh, 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 improving their talents. Up to the Korakoram Highway on the way to the Chinese border. Um, this is the highest paid border crossing in the world. This is what it looks like as you cross that border into Xinjiang province. It's pretty um, surreal. And then we are across into Xinjiang province um, and into Kashgar. This is the Idkar Mosque, some of the wonderful characters around town, the Dutta, Tajik bread. This is at the bazaar, some scenes of making noodles and uh, across the Taklamakan Desert, through the Gobi, um, into Jia Yuguan, which was the, uh, a kind of garrison for troops who were protecting the trade routes, into Xi'an, this is the Muslim quarter where a lot of people ended up. Uh, at, uh, at the end of the terminus of the trade route and stayed here and established the Muslim quarter. This is the great, great mosque of Xi'an, which was established in 742, which is pretty extraordinary. I think that's about 100, 120 years after the establishment of Islam that it traveled all this way. And uh, some more scenes from that and into Beijing. And uh, I, will, I will leave it there. So I, I managed it in about 16 minutes, sorry. And I'll just show you a little bit, a few photos of the exhibition that is now, was on Granary Square, it's just moved. Um, and the idea was to create a route so that you could walk from London to Beijing through these photographs and take a journey yourself and just learning about the people, places and cultures in between. Uh, this was the route. Um, this is what it looked like um, in situ. This is just a section of it. Um, some more photos from it here um, and some more photos here, some more here. And that's it. So I encourage you, we have a, a website called silkroad-livinghistory.org. There, there is lots more information about the exhibition. There's my email address if you want to get in touch. Um, I'm afraid I have to jump off after this, but it's been such a privilege to, to, to take you on this journey. I hope you enjoyed it. And um, please, if you have any questions, do write to me and I'll be happy to be in touch with you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's amazing. It's really amazing. And uh, I hope uh, all have enjoyed it like uh, I did. And yesterday I was wrote a post that uh, the world is a book and those who cannot travel, it just read uh, one page. So I am feeling the same. Anyways, thank you so much for sharing your experiences of uh, very people, places and cultures. Uh, next we have Dr. I, I hope so, I pronounced it correctly. Um, Dr. Kenshabak Alma Kochoko. Can you listen to me, uh, sir? I'm so sorry for the pronunciation. Uh, no, no problem, no problem. Thank you so uh, much. Uh, uh, let me introduce uh, uh, sir is basically uh, appointed as a director of National History Museum uh, in 2018. And uh, he is a, uh, he's basically EF Central Asia Art Management Camp from Kazakh Republic. Sir, uh, we have already uh, uh, with the delay, so please uh, take the floor. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Hello, guys. I'd like to uh, represent my uh, short presentation. And uh, the name of my presentation is uh, called Silk Road Water Logistics Wealth. I'd like to share with you just in abstracts. So, uh, could you see my presentation? 
Of course. Ah, yes, okay. Yes. Uh, at the beginning, I'd like to say some uh, general information, and uh, I think uh, this it, it, uh, would be uh, necessary. The Venetian merchant Marco Polo was the first to call this road Silk Road, as you know. And at the end of the 19th century, the German researcher Ferdinand Friedhofen introduced the science term with the poetic connotation of the Great Silk Road. And there is much evidence of the reality on how this path. Uh, I mean, we know, and uh, at present time, uh, we have uh, some ideas to uh, uh, to revitalize this uh, project. Each country, based on its own conditions, took its place in this uh, in the big trade. Silk was the main commodity, but not only one that was transported along the continental route. Uh, historical records show that China exported, in addition to silk, porcelain, and metal utensils, cosmetics, tea, rice. From there, such uh, inventions as uh, gunpowder, compost, paper, and printing uh, was spread throughout the world. From the countries of South and Southeast Asia, merchants brought spices to Europe, pepper, cinnamon, cloves, nutmeg, etc. In turn, China was supplied with uh, horses from the Middle East and the Central Asia, including uh, purebred horses, military equipment, pet rumped sheep and uh, hunting ducks, leopards and lions, gold and silver, semi-precious stones and the glass products, leather and wool, carpets, wool and cotton fabrics, spices and exotic fruits. Thus, the... <laughs> Sorry. Do you hear me? Yes, of course. Yes, okay, yes, please sir. follow. Uh -huh. uh, tourism aspect. We have analyzed the literature, which uh, allows us to formulate the elements of organizational and economic decisions in the field of tourism on the Great Silk Road for Kyrgyzstan. Inclusion of cultural artifacts to the in the market tenure bundling, selling a group of several products or services as a whole. It is obvious that in the tourist category of Great Silk Road, its cultural component can become the main one and directly tourist services, accommodation, food, transfer, transfer uh, take the place of auxiliary services. When the main motive of trips is the acquaintance with the historical and the cultural heritage, monuments of history, architecture, cultural, art, etc. Uh, competition with cooperation aspect. However, the development of the Great Silk Road route tourism category in Kyrgyzstan is difficult without regional cooperation with the countries that link the historical route, especially with China and Uzbekistan. In addition to the lack of agreements on transit user support between the countries, the problem hindering the development of this uh, tourism category is the lack of packaged tourism products. Obviously, by default, countries by default uh, countries compete with each other for tourist flows and they do not show much enthusiasm for sharing income. As a result, the Kyrgyz section of the GSR loses to its neighbors. However, the implementation of the global project One Belt, One Way provides the opportunity to synchronize competitive behavior, convert competition into cooperation. A special tourist routes. In this report, uh, in this presentation, we would like to focus on the need for research on the development of competitive behavior through new subject areas of research, for instance, Studying the features of transport transfer structure of the GSR and uh, filling the content of the UNESCO online platform Great Silk Road. You can check it uh, by this uh, email, uh, by this website address. Speaking about the package tourist product, we are not limited to the following combination of services air ticket, hotel transport services, leisure, but we point out the need to develop special tourist routes. That, we, that would be interesting to tourists and that would dictate the conditions to, to operators. Then, 
From our point of view, the development of a tourist route connected with the transfer infrastructure of GSR is having good prospects. On the main advantages, uh, one of the main advantages, uh, advantages of the Silk Road was drink water wells. Uh, uh, surface water collectors, underground water sources, and the condensation of water from hot air, drunk effect. Thus, when laying caravan route, when laying caravan route, many factors were taken into account, including the availability of guaranteed access to safe drinking water. As we understand, to increase the useful loading of caravans, the route were planned in such a way that the pack animals didn't carry extra water supplies except for minimum required for one crossing. This is some uh, pictures. Uh, they were taken from the internet sources. And uh, these uh, buildings uh, are wells. Uh, as you can see, uh, this uh, the last one is a uh, uh, water source from, under, from the underground. And the others are described uh, some uh, uh, as constructions of wells of the wells. How can this can uh, how can this be explained? You know, the for the camels or horses not to carry containers with water of them, which took up a useful space and reduces the volume of the transported cargo. The ingenious designers of antiquity built wells in the middle of the hot sand. Why is this interesting? We propose the development of a package tourist product wells on the Great Silk Road. It is necessary to conduct appropriate research and, if necessary, to reconstruct the wells. Why is this interesting? Because the engineering and the construction solutions used to provide travelers and the caravans of pet animals with drinking water are admirable. Uh, as you know, roads road we are built along the wells along the wells that had the sufficient water supplies so that the uh, caravans of one or two hundred camels or horses uh, could be watered thus a popular tourist product can be an example for synchronizing competitive behavior of the participant of the participating countries so uh, at present International cultural exchange is uh, acquiring uh, qualitatively new features and uh, is characterized by an, an increased scale. The online platform Silk Road, created by UNESCO, allows us to begin the revival of the GSR in the modern di digital space, creates conditions for the development of the national framework for the tourist nomination, the Great Silk Road. The Silk Road online platform provides access to historical and cultural heritage in museums and collections around the world, both in countries in the territory of the Silk Road and the beyond. Sustainability. UNESCO has initiated, uh, has united the rich material and the intangible heritage of historical routes, a large number of film, photo, and the video materials, publications, and research. But this refers uh, there are navigators that allow uh, for this uh, first, there are navigators that allow uh, you to familiarize, familiarize the visitor with the material and intangible heritage along the corresponding along the corresponding routes. Thanks to this project, uh, cultural interaction would receive a new impetus through the sustainable development of the creative industries, education, and tourism. The tourism product. Tourism on the Steel Great Silk Road is an example of the transformation of competition and the competitive relations to cooperation between business entities and between countries for the flow of tourists. This is a paradox of synchronization of competitive behavior. So, uh, the Great Silk Road absorbed all the best of the engineering practices that existed at that time. Maybe we, can, we could start the research to this, in this direction. So I have finalized my presentation. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Keneshabak. I'm so sorry for the pronunciation. I'm so embarrassed. Uh, 
the uh, the well and the water storage you have shown i have seen some in my city where i do live but it's not like a, a well it's kind of a water storage uh, but it's really interesting and i often see that how it's a benefit the people and the animal both uh, wish uh, we can uh, initiate any such project in future thank you so much and uh, now we have our final presentation and this is a special one uh, those who love who are the tea lovers uh, this is basically for them uh, we have uh, sandeep here uh, our next presenter she is a junior research fellow and i comp uh, mongolia uh, member please sandeep if you can listen me please i cannot see you here Oh yes. Okay. So she will describe uh, the key history of uh, Mongolian influence. So, so over to you. Uh huh. I'm sorry for the pronunciation. That's why I cannot, uh, you know, uh, recite your, your name again and again. It's fine. You can call me Sundu. <laughs> Thank you so much. I understand you. Please over to you. Can you see my? Yes, yes, it is visible. Yes, it is visible. Okay, thank you. Okay, hello everyone. Thank you for organizing the conference I've come. Uh, 2021 with the theme, the Silk Road, uh, Silk Road Heritage Collection and the Connection with Museums. I will give you a talk in inheriting the Mongolian tea tradition with participation of museums. The, um, tendency to in inherit tangible cultural heritage through nature friendly museums and public participation and support family livelihood, a new phenomenon at the museum in Mongolia. The concept of methodology of inheriting intangible cultural heritage in Mongolia from this concept will be described in the tea recipes and ceremony projects implemented in the Burkhanga Museum. And, the, the, this uh, first paragraph is the, my theory, which I followed in the, during the, this presenta presentation. There's about the local community and local studies. From the above theoretical point of view, the community is local people, Burkhangasom, and that cooperates with PM. This community united geographical administrative units. units. The partnership is the part of Burkhanga Museum and com community relations as well as group of knowledge users who participate in the museum's local history and education programs and disseminate knowledge from the museum. The local studies of the Burkhanga Museum include the research in, on the biographies and the works of local people, the content of the resulting educational program, the technological analysis and the group of audience research. The study includes scientific conferences, field work, works of natural ethnography and interviews with local people about their natural lifestyle, customs, moods, and the establishment of a museum with the participations. Uh, this is the North Mongolia, both um, uh, can you see this purple one with smile? Uh, this is the Burg Hangasom. Uh, Burg Hangasom is the Bolkhom province is located in the Han Hanga Mountain region of Mongolia, the northern side. It's the 265 kilometers from Ulamatr, uh, 206 kilometers private, and 86 kilometers from Bolkhom province center. This summer has integrated electricity network, it's a mobile phone networks. This home has the livestock and agriculture region with a population of only 2,547 people and see, 700, 765 families, and the mining industry has been developing in the recent years. Uh, this is the Irtin Mirgen Bandita. He was born in John Guni Hoshu of Tushet Hanaim in 1847, now Burkhangasum. He wrote many books, a wise Sambo's book detailing about making good smells for tea, giving alms by tea, providing grits for tea, tea recipes, tea ceremonies, and rituals. However, the, despite widespread rituals of making tea, drinking tea, offering tea samples to the mountains, and herbal tea making technology left by Awai Sambi is very little inherited 
and forgotten in among local community. There's also his famous, famous in the alternate Calpus words, the Marmon's words, the old cause words I about the with content that uh, focused, focused on save and love nature, human treatment of nature, hatred, the cruel, training, anti oppression of others, and compassion for orphans. Orphans. He used to touch all of this uh, for people through his water. Uh, this is the Burkhangasum, the most of people in Burkhangasum, they are Buddhist. Uh, in 2012, the Mongolia Research Institute of Culture and Arts and Burkhanga local community organized the conference on the biography of works of Awash Sambo. The local people who attended the meeting got acquainted the life of uh, life and the works of Awash Sambo and afraid to transfer his biography to the museum. They wanted to make the, the history of ordinary people born in their homeland part of their lives and lifestyles and to tell their stories by the museum. Uh, thus, the public will await some of biography and the works and material cultures of Som by local studies uh, provided opportunity to, to establish museum and the Burkhanga Museum opened its doors to the public on August 1st, 2030. In Awai Sambo's book, Sutras, he wrote the recipes of tea with herbal integrants collected from the mountains of Burkhangasom and about the technology cooking tea beverages, which became the ready content of Burkhanga Museum's educational event. Because of the traditional tea technology has been forgotten, there's no inheritor in among Burkhanga people to recognize the tea herbs nowadays. Therefore, the project team includes, which includes botanists, cultural heritage researchers, lawyers, and museum education officers. They are developed the contents of the educational program, traditional tea recipe. They, their responsibility where they teach for selected students to learn how to identify the collective planets through a partnership and apprenticeship with the legal framework uh, on tea marketing, packing, tea making ceremonies through classroom training. Uh, first of all, uh, project, the team carried out step-by-step -step per processes of shifting uh, inheriting traditional tea recipes ceremonies, herbs, tea utilities to intangible and intangible heritage. This includes the introduction of the traditional tea it receives a program by botanist lawyers, culture heritage researchers to, to the National Center for Culture Heritage, local governments and universities between 2013-2014. According to the orders in 2019-2015, uh, the Minister of, Minister of Education, Culture and Science of Mongolia, the traditional method of making tea bearers is registered in the national list of intangible cultural heritage in, in need of urgent safeguarding. The traditional theater program had many benefits, not only for local people, but also for Mongolia, such as reviewing the forgetting intangible heritage and recognizing traditional theater ceremonies and the rituals. The, there's the members of a project team, Mrs. Batam District, a researcher in Batanes at the National Museum of Natural History, she discovered the variety of local tea planets and installed them in the museum. She planned to, to teach technology of identifying, collecting, drying, and preserving tea planets mentioned in the sutras of our, our Sambo. The Mr. Dushintol, uh, he's a and researcher at the Research Institute of Law. Uh, he was uh, working the responsibility for educating local people on local natural environmental law, forest and planet researchers law, administration in the, the legal of local communities and capacity building. There's the, some um, uh, tea herbs, which is bottom stick described. The Shifan described three kinds of planets, the Burkhanga's home. Uh, there's this uh, name in Latin, uh, all of these, uh, planets which is dried in 
displayed in the, at the museum. Uh, the next member of the project team, the Dr. Tawasron, his director of uh, Research Institute of Culture and Arts, Culture Institute of Culture and Arts, Culture Heritage Researcher, instructed the, the participant in the tea ceremony to take their seat, how to sit, how to hold tea cup, how to drink, what to think during the tea ceremony, prepare tea, light uh, fire, offering sacrifices to the fire, making tea, performing other rituals, such as knitting, testing, and kneading, pouring tea into a special container, offering sample to the world, Hanga, Hanga Mountains, holding cup of tea for guests, placing tea with nutritional and healing purposes, and drinking tea. There's the, some photos, tea tra tradition of tea, taking seat, preparing tea, wearing sa sample to the Hanga Mountains and tea party outside and inside uh, from Mongolians, of Mongolians. Uh, as a Muslim educational officer, XP, I installed tea, tea list, pots, pans, fireplace, and cup bags. Uh, by the locals, about 100 uh, locals used it 100 years ago, uh, 100 years ago at the Burkhanga Museum. Uh, there's the cup of bag. Uh, can you see this uh, bag on the walls, which is hangs on the wall? The, this is the bag that um, usually the Mongolian man used to hang from the belt during the traveling. The, in addition, I developed a proposal to define and establish tea preparation, packing in a situation, livelihood, support tea recipe, recipe technology, ceremony for museum education season, schedule designs, hides community participation for target customers. Uh, the next slide is the through the all activities of inheriting of in the tangible cultural heritage through the museum, we freeze the ideas of save and love of nature, human and compassionate treatment of nature, human compassion that continued of August Sambo's photos. In other words, it is read by audience in the exhibition hall that photo audience will learn to be kind and will inherit a wide range in the rituals such as saving land, meadows, and nature, saving planets and animals, offering in milk for best wishes. We are all, uh, all members, uh, they freeze all of these uh, ideas of uh, Aguay Sambo's photos in the educational program. In conclusion, the Burkhanga Museum established by the Soma communities and inspirations and efforts without any orders from the government or the ministry, the museum exhibitions, the history, memories, and material culture of some people were represented. Many be beautiful rituals and material culture of Burhanga some were shifted to the museum. Today, the uh, some community organizers and participants even events in the museum to respect the memory of the political oppression victims and uh, pay attention to the bringing of their children after. Uh, the museum project in, to inherit tier cipher technology and ceremonies has been disrupted due to uh, finding uh, the local people are able to learn about their uh, history members of ordinary people who created tea planets and tea ceremonies rituals. The community museum, which based of geographic, ethnographic, ethnic, economic, lifestyle, and interest groups has been potential to inherit intangible cultural heritage through tea ceremonies and to develop, expand the museum's tourism program. It depends uh, on many resources and interests and aspirations of people. In this way, the community museum helps the people to live in a more friendly environment to live healthy life and member for uh, remember of the preserved the history and culture. Thank you for your attention. There's the, my name and phone. If you want to uh, ask questions, call me. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a wonderful presentation and uh, I hope we all uh, 
uh, all I have enjoyed as I enjoyed like me. And you know, the history of tea is basically uh, uh, spread in this. Uh, I mean, it's a it has a kind of a spread on uh, multiple cultures and a span of thousands of years. And still today, it is an essential part of our culture. Uh, now we are open for the question and answer sessions. Uh, if anyone wants to ask any questions, uh, uh, they are open for uh, their questions and answers. Anyone please? Or we will read the questions from the uh, chat box. I would have an, uh, a question actually for uh, uh, Dr. Needham, if I could. Yes, about please. The coins, yeah. Uh, again, uh, thank you for that wonderful presentation. Uh, see, I don't, is he present? No, I'm here. I'm here. Oh, yes. Um, and uh, first of all, I mean, I fully agree with you about the use of XRF. Uh, I think that was great that you brought this up. Of course, it's uh, archaeologists use it all the time, uh, mainly for ceramics. But I also, in my experience uh, in numismatics, it is rarely used. So I fully agree with you on this. Uh, but I actually have a question uh, to you about uh, a set of, uh, you probably are familiar as well with these Kushan coins that depict uh, a wide variety of iconography and languages, like, uh, for example, this one here. Um, I hope you can yes. see it through through the camera very briefly, very yes, famous Kushan coins. Yes. Um, and so far, uh, most studies about this are very confused because they have uh, different religions, Buddhism, Hinduism, Zoroastrianism depicted with the Kushan kings like Kanishka um, and uh, different languages as well. But would you suggest that this is actually a symptom of them being used in silk or trade so that this cultural variety in a, in a sense didn't matter because they were weighed. Uh, I, I think possibly this could be a very interesting uh, solution for, for these coins. This is, this is a very interesting question and I think we should take uh, the discussion um, via emails. The okay. question on Kushan coinage is, is either extremely complex or extremely simple. Because also in that area, there, there's been a lot of discussion about whether silver was used in certain times. And I wrote a narrative in defense of silver, of why silver was there, because many silver coins from this time have been declared as fake, which is, which is wrong. The Kushan coin, coins and their, their light need to be better illustrated by using Tarix and my method, if I could be so bold, where it has become clear that you use a specific color for the ruler's name, a specific color for something else, uh, and a specific color for something else. It is hoped that one of my young researchers will go back and look at Kushan coins in a, in a year's time, but on the basis of using the unit theory to develop um, what is the actual uh, content of precious metals in the coins and by forming a base. You are right about the Silk Road. Anything could be used on the Silk Road because everybody knew about it. Kushan coins are an enigma in many ways and they need further research. But please, we need to correspond on this because we have some plans coming up that perhaps you know we can do some joint work or at least I can lead through. On XRF, I ran a major test under strict conditions at the Ashmolean a number of years ago, and basically the results were, many of the results were stolen. The results did not show what some people wanted them to show. It showed that production from mints in the subcontinent was brilliant. We had plus or minus 0.3% of silver in coins. Um, we showed that coins that were said to be tin were in fact zinc, for example. That's why we have developed a standard operating procedure. Uh, much of the work that I've done in recent years is commercial and confidence, but that is now ended. And we have a number of major projects that are just starting. And we will be uh, helping a number of groups uh, in making sure that they're um, 
what they show cannot be contested. So please, um, if you come back through through the organisers yep. to, to my email address, etc., my working email address, we need to correspond because if I can give full direction to some young people on what we want to do, I think cooperation yep. is going to be brilliant here. That sounds and wonderful. I thank you yep. so much. Yeah, so one of my PhDs is actually using XRF on ceramics, and their findings are also very contradictory to what is usually considered. We have much more ceramics actually made in the Indian subcontinent than previously determined. So uh, in, in Oman and, uh, and also in Egypt. So this really corresponds with your findings. So let's definitely uh, continue this discussion uh, in correspondence. Yes. That would be wonderful. Yes. The unfortunate thing is we can keep going for days. So we best yes. leave it to <laughs> <laughs> we, we will stop. We will stop now. But uh, let's, no, no, uh, let's okay. definitely follow up. Yeah. Thank you uh, very it's much. Okay. Uh, it's okay. I'm really sorry but because we have time limitation is the problem in virtual conferences. But uh, Dr. Ortha, maybe you write your... Uh, can you hear me properly? Yes, you're fine. Okay. Maybe you can write your email address in chat box. So maybe someone else can contact you later on. For, for further research or something. And next we have a question from uh, which I can see is uh, uh, Mr. Nidin and it's uh, for Dr. Keshebek. Uh, the question is that are some of these wells you showed like the Karas type of well of Persian origin but also seen in the Indian uh, Dakkan. Also where you have a sweet water wells from where? Oh, sorry, I lost the message. Oh yeah, from where water is lifted and taken along underwater canals, uh, where there are some opening on the surfaces. Oh. Okay. Yeah, Zaida, Zaida, sorry, I, yes, I, uh, well, that's all right. Yes. I, I can ask. I, I can ask him. Directly. Yes, please, because uh, I have a kind of okay. personal problem. No problem. Absolutely, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. I, I was, of course, of course, Arthur just messaged me, but I was curious to know if these were all standalone wells or uh, they were well. Very often the hills have water, so there are spots from where water flows down, and this water is trapped and taken along channels across long distances. And at different points along the channel, you have other wells at the surface. Uh, wherein water is again lifted through these underground channels. So this is a well-known technology employed in, in Persia and Iran. So I was curious if along the Silk Road, uh, in the deserts, you also saw this. That that was my question. Uh, thank you so much for your interest. I, I'd like to clarify one uh, topic. What it means, uh, sweet water? I, I don't know. Yeah, that's water. water. Drinking water. Drinking ah, water. Yeah, drinking water. Okay. Now uh, I'd like uh, to. Uh, I wanted to uh, focus your mind on the how to find the topic for our cooperation, not to confess with each other, because uh, during these three days we have been uh, talking about different ideas, but all of them were. Uh, uh, related to their museums or their own uh, business. Now, my uh, message was how to how we can cooperate with each other, and I think that uh, this uh, uh, constructing or developing new tourist products related uh, with this uh, water supplies could uh, uh, push us to cooperate with each other and. Uh, uh, second part of your question, uh, I'd like to uh, focus uh, your uh, focus uh, your mind to the specific technologies of uh, watering uh, when uh, in the desert there were uh, wells uh, where um, where was condensed from hot, uh, hot air, not from underground, from not a uh, deep uh, lies of the uh, land, but from the hot uh, air, 
uh, the previous engineers could uh, condense water and uh, then uh, could uh, watering could uh, make watering for uh, livestock. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, anyone else is interested for any question, please? Yeah, I, I had a question for Dr. Maridike. Yes, please go ahead. Yeah, so Dr. Marike, your talk was fascinating and you mentioned that there are not many sources, you know, like manuscripts available, or documentation available, uh, which can tell us more about the Silk Road. So I'm, I'm quite surprised uh, that there are not many because, you know, the Silk Road encompassed a very vast area. Uh, just as we saw in the beautiful, uh, uh, you know, presentation of the train and the voyage that took him uh, all across the route. So I'm surprised that none of the archives, none of the archival sources yet, I mean, they could be through Iran and India and uh, whatever is left of Afghanistan and Central Asia, Soviet archives, you know, the old ones in Bukhara or Tashkent, wherever. Uh, don't we have enough documents or enough about where we can reconstruct the Silk Route from, from these documents. So I'm, I'm quite surprised as to why we don't have these manuscripts. Okay, well, thank you for this question. Uh, I think you slightly misunderstood what I said in the presentation. Um, obviously, there is many textual sources from the land route to Persia, Afghanistan. Um, I, what I mentioned in my presentation is we have not many documentation of the rock art in the Karakoram. Um, also, okay, this is okay. a much yes. So this is a much earlier uh, time as well. Huh? So we're we're sitting here from the time of the Maria kings, which is 300 BC. So long before uh, the Islamic Silk Roads uh, emerged. And from this time, the rock art uh, in the Karakoram and the inscriptions in Brahmi and Karoshti are some of the oldest known texts actually that mention caravans going through the mountains, but they are much older up until the Kushan period, which is around roughly 200 CE. So all this trade predates the kind of Silk Road that we saw in, uh, for example, Christopher's wonderful presentation, that is almost a millennium later. So uh, there are a lot of okay. texts, obviously, by Persian scholars, uh, like, for example, al Khassini, who himself traveled all the way uh, from cities uh, across the road. Um, for the older, the early Silk Road, which is really the origin of these routes, uh, a millennium earlier, uh, there are some texts uh, like the Han, Han Shu Chinese text, uh, some inscriptions again in Brahmi and Karoshti, uh, but the rock art in the Karakoram is one of the most valuable and earliest uh, sources, and many are not yet documented. So hopefully this clarifies it a little bit. And of course, I would never dare to claim that uh, there are no recordings uh, of the wider Silk Road. Uh, so hopefully this answers your question. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Marike. Yes, please, Dr. Arthur, please. In, in wandering through the Karakorams and some of the other areas, there are extensive uh, areas of rock art, not just on the main trail, but on the subsidiary trails that led to major villages, etc. And it is quite fascinating, and, and the discussion about near well, what we call caravanserais, most of the uh, uh, workers on, on domestic animals and away from there, the workers on uh, wild animals. This is something that jogged my memory and what I saw in the late 70s and the 80s, and that is certainly correct. But so many of these things are quite, are quite widespread and the study is long overdue and extremely interesting. It's going to take a lot of work and um, we're hoping next uh, next spring we can have another campaign. There's a lot of carving still to document, um, but we are hopefully soon we can make at least this campaign available on open access, but you're absolutely right. Um, uh, our, also our team, some of the members are from the region and they also know many more carvings far away from the, the main rivers indeed. So yeah, there's a lot of work to be done. So. Um, we will see how it goes. Yeah. I wish I was 30 years younger. <laughs>
thank you so much uh, is there any other question we still have some time for discussion and for q and session no questions okay thank you so much well i have just one concern maybe because uh, i'm working on disaster uh, project these days and whenever i was uh, uh, you know working on it i have just thought that uh, Uh, we have a kind of very rich heritage uh, all over the world, uh, and if we are talking about self heritage, we are connecting it to heritage and culture. What if with the if in the war situation, uh, we cannot protect this heritage? Because see, terrorism is uh, not uh, in our control, but we can uh, advocate our governments to protect these cultural heritage sites or whatever uh, you know heritage we have along with these countries. At least we cannot destroy this heritage, uh, in, uh, you know, in any kind of attack or bombing or something. So, I hope so. We can uh, respect the uh, UNESCO's Hague uh, Convention in this regard. But uh, well, it's uh, out of the session. Uh, well, thank you so much, uh, all of you. For your participation and for joining us today, uh, indeed, this uh, conference is uh, not just uh, uh, an effort of one person or one individual. It's a joint effort from ICOM Pakistan, from Dubai, Dubai, and uh, many more people, uh, which I would like to mention: uh, young girls, Jamile and Nafisa. Uh, they both uh, are us uh, since the day one. Uh, is it fine? Can you hear? <laughs> Because I saw that my sound is breaking. That's better when it's close. Okay, so uh, I really would like to thank uh, Jamile and Nafisa, the young girls who are our technical supporters throughout the session, and uh, all the team of ICOM Pakistan, all the team of ICOM Mongolia, uh, National Museum, National History Museum of Kazakhstan, and uh, uh, our partners from Kumit Turki. Thank you so much for your support for being with us. We have a final and the fourth session tomorrow uh, on same time. It is science and art session, so hopefully you will enjoy it. Till then, thank you so much and I love this. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Absolutely wonderful. Have thank you so day. much. Yes, Bye. it was really great. I'm